I inform the Senate that at 8.30 am today, eight proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Keneally proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to make a contribution on this MPI that after the Morrison jo Joyce government has failed to deliver on its promise to vaccinate 4 million Australians by the end of March 2021, vaccinate all of the first priority group by Easter 2021 and vaccinate 6 million Australians by the 10th of May 2021. Last weekend, Australia experienced its highest daily COVID case number since the pandemic began 18 months ago. I don't have to remind anyone in this chamber, as I don't have to remind anyone outside this chamber, of the serious nature of this pandemic and the impact of a hapless, unorganised, disorganised, chaotic government who failed to secure the health and safety of its citizens. And that rests solely with one man. That's the Prime Minister of this country, Scott Morrison. He failed to meet his own dates that he put in place to reassure Australians that he was on the job. I don't know how many times we've been in this chamber and reminded the Prime Minister that he has had two jobs during this pandemic, two crucial jobs. One was to roll out the vaccine in a timely way to protect the health of the Australian people, to protect the economy and to provide adequate quarantine. And he has failed on both of those tasks. But the consequence of his failure has seen too many Australians lose their lives. Too many vulnerable older, older Australians who have died needlessly because of the failure of this man. Now, when you're Prime Minister of a country, it is expected that you will show leadership. This is the same man who said there isn't a race. There's no race to uh, roll out the vaccine. There's no race. There is a race, and the race was always about ensuring Australians' health, ensuring that the Australian economy was protected, ensuring that Australians could feel sec secure in their jobs and secure in knowing that their Prime Minister was on the job, and he has failed on all accounts. What we see now is that there are over 16 million Australians in lockdown around this country. Families being locked down. Children being locked down at home and parents are having to resort to going back to homeschooling. That has an impact on that family. It has an impact on the community. If we go through and we look at the the frontline workers in this country, the truckies, the people who work in retail, our health workers, our school teachers, our aged care workers, our disability carers. These are the people that should have been a priority to keeping our economy moving and helping to ensure the health and safety of this country and of the people. But we still have not seen all aged care workers vaccinated in this country. We still have not seen all disability carers fully vaccinated. We still have not seen even a plan to address the home care, aged care workers that go into our older Australians, our most vulnerable Australians, in their own homes for those workers to be fully vaccinated. We have stories coming in, calls, people upset, concerned about their loved ones because they can't access the vaccine or the vaccine that they would want. 
This is the government who failed to secure enough vaccines to ensure their community, their residents, were kept safe. Now we know uh, that the Prime Minister never likes to accept responsibility for his own failings. We see that time and time again with what is uh, a pretty sad reflection on his ministry when you see his uh, Senator Colbert come into this chamber and want to talk about the amount of vaccines that have been rolled out over the last couple of weeks as if that's something to be proud of. All that is is an acknowledgement that they have failed to meet their own timelines that they set themselves. Now, those people on that side of the chamber may think that, well, you know, that's okay, we can get away with this. People are now uh, lining up for five hours to get their vaccination. So all's good, nothing to see here. Well, this is the Prime Minister after three years of this Prime Minister who on every occasion wants to blame somebody else, accept no responsibility. What he's going to be remembered for is being the Prime Minister who was only good at slogans and trying to spin his way out of trouble. That's what Mr Morrison is going to be remembered for, the Prime Minister who always went missing in a crisis, just as he did through the 2019-20 uh, bushfires. What we saw in those circumstances was, I don't hold a hose. And then I don't give jabs. That is not good enough. This is a war against this pandemic. This is when a prime minister is supposed to stand up and be counted, and he's failing to do that. In my home state of Tasmania, we fortunately aren't in lockdown. But what we are seeing is the effect of New South Wales, Victoria, and at times Queensland. WA, South Australia, going into lockdowns, that has an impact on our community, that has an impact on our economy, it has an impact on our small businesses. But no, I never hear any one of the Liberal senators from Tasmania come in here and talk up for the small businesses, to speak up for the school teachers who can't get a vaccine. We don't see them coming in defending their government about the, their pathetic uh, attempts to secure the safety of Australians. What we don't see is a Prime Minister and his government taking responsibility. Now, we've had other senators making a contribution through the course of this week, talking about our First Nation people who have such a low vaccination rate. These are also some of the most vulnerable people in our community. Western Sydney, the western parts in Orange, Bathurst, Dubbo, that there's a spike in outbreaks there. And teachers who are working with special needs children who should be a priority have been told that they will have to wait till next year to get a vaccine when they rang around doctors, surgeries, pharmacies because they don't want to have to have the AZ vaccine. They want to have Pfizer. So this government will be reminded every single day that we sit about their failings, and they must be held accountable for their failings, because our economy and the Australian citizens deserve nothing less. Now, this, this shifting of blame trying to say that we support and we want people to stay in lockdown is ridiculous. We want to see the Australian people going back to their old way of life. Of course that's what we want. But we wanted that to have happened because people have been vaccinated according to the Prime Minister's own timelines. To March in, in this year, to Easter at this year, to the six million Australians that were going to be vaccinated by the 10th of May in 2021. Then it was we were all going to be vaccinated by October. Those deadlines were not met, and I have no faith that this government will be able to meet even, even their own latest deadline of October or the end of this year. 
Other countries around the world are already looking at boosters for their residents, but we are so far behind. How many more people are going to have to die? And when the Prime Minister says that we are going to have to learn to live with this pandemic, then it will be on his head. How are we then going to live with the amount of people that are going to die if we open up the borders before all Australians are vaccinated? How are we going to be dealing with those deaths? Because that is the situation if he forces states to pull down their borders before the majority of Australians are vaccinated in this country. Enough Order. is enough, Senator Prime Polly, Minister. Time has Get on and do your. Senator Polly, Senator Henderson, remotely. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. President. Uh, it is my pleasure to, to rise and speak on this MPI which regrettably, Mr President, reflects the Labor Party's determination to focus on petty politicking, on personal political attacks and not on the national interest. And I say to Senator Polly and to all Labor senators opposite, Australians are sick of this negativity, of dragging down the achievements of Australians, of our nation, of our health workers, of our cleaners, of our families struggling with homeschooling, of our businesses, Australians are sick of it. So I say, what about starting to put the national interest first? Because this politicking is a disgrace. And Senator Polly, I say to Senator Polly, I am outraged. I am outraged by your statement attributing blame to the Prime Minister personally for COVID deaths. That is an absolute disgrace. You should withdraw that appalling statement. And the facts are, the Coat Inquiry found, the evidence is, the facts are, that the vast majority of COVID deaths in this country, 801 deaths, were caused by the failure of hotel quarantine in Victoria last year. That is the facts. And talking of slogans, Senator Polly, let's have a look at Labor slogans. Labor keeps on claiming that we failed with quarantine. The bottom line is, and the facts are, that the Labor Premier is determined to take responsibility for quarantine. In fact, that was led by Premier Andrews last April when he put forward the hotel quarantine plan to National Cabinet, which was accepted. So please start telling the truth. The fact of the matter is the Commonwealth is playing its part, but quarantine has been taken on as a responsibility by the states. And one of the most successful quarantine facilities is in Howard Springs in the Northern Territory, with supported by an investment of more than half a billion dollars, which is taking the bulk of repatriation flights into this country. Uh, in Victoria, the Morrison government has also agreed to share the cost of, uh, cost of quarantine with the state for a new quarantine facility uh, in Melbourne. So let's stick to the facts and stop this revolting politicking. So the first thing that I want to say in my contribution, positively, frankly, and let's focus on the positives, is to all Australians who are eligible, please get vaccinated. What a shame we didn't hear that from Senator Polly. Today we have wonderful news that Australians aged between 16 and 39 will be able to book their Pfizer vaccination from 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, and we are seeing a dramatic escalation in vaccination rates. So some of the figures that we've heard from Labor are, are just a misrepresentation of the facts. The fact is that over 17 million vaccine doses have now been administered and we are now hitting over 1.8 million doses administered every single week. A total of 4.5 vaccinations were given in July, which is more than double that achieved in May when 2.1 million doses were administered. And yes, there have been some challenges, uh, principally with supply, but these have largely been overcome and I wish Labor would tell Australians that. Give Australians hope, I say to Labor senators, give Australians hope that there is a way out of this. Uh, our government has secured 
nearly uh, close to 300 million doses of various vaccinations. And let's not forget that based on our hard work, based on the decisions that we made very early in the piece in relation to the management of the pandemic, including closing the border with China, which occurred in January of last year, uh, we have saved together, working together, 30,000 lives. Uh, we have been very proud to support over 3 million Australians through programs like JobKeeper, getting 1 million Australians back to work. There is a lot this government has got right. And now, of course, Lieutenant General Fruin and his team are working with the Health Minister and the Department of Health doing a, a great job in accelerating the rollout of the vaccinations. So, as the Prime Minister has said, to keep Australia focused on going forward, uh, we need to make sure that we stick to our national plan, and that is that once we achieve 70 to 80 per cent vaccination rates, uh, we will see less transmission of COVID-19, fewer people with severe illness, and therefore fewer hospitalisations and deaths. And as the Doherty Institute has said, COVID-19 won't go away, but it will be easier to control in the future. And that is the hope that Australians need. And as I say again, please to Labor senators, please to the Leader of the Opposition, please start talking about hope. Please start talking about what we can do to, together as a nation. Please start talking about the importance of the national plan, because the bottom line is we can't live in lockdown forever. And I have been very critical of Daniel Andrews and state Labor at times when they have plunged <laughs> us into lockdown, particularly in parts of Victoria where there are no cases. I am deeply critical of the fact that there are children currently at boarding school in New South Wales who cannot get a permit to cross the border to come back to Victoria to their families, which in my view is a breach of the Victorian Charter of Human Rights. This is outrageous. There are elderly people sitting in caravan parks in Albury and across the border, they cannot get a permit to return to Victoria. So we have got to manage these lockdowns better. They must be a last resort. And when we hit those 70 and 80% vaccination rates, we need to see Australia opening up. As the Prime Minister has made clear, as the Treasurer has made clear, we cannot live in lockdown forever. We need to open up our economy, get kids back to school, people back to work, and we need to give Australians hope. The Prime Minister has reiterated that the groundhog day of rolling lockdowns gripping the, the nation must not last a day more than necessary. The Premiers and the First Ministers must stick to the national plan. And it is deeply concerning that some premiers are already indicating that they will walk away or walk back from this national plan. And even Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews will not rule out further lockdowns, even though we reach the 70 or 80 per cent vaccination rate. The Herald Sun reported today that Premier Andrews said that once Victoria reaches a vaccination rate of 80 per cent of those aged over 16, there would not be a statewide lockdown unless otherwise advised. So I say to Premier Andrews, what sort of hope is that? What sort of plan is that? This is deeply troubling. This saps confidence from every single Victorian, particularly the businesses which have been hit so hard in the events sector, in hospitality, in arts, in tourism. These are businesses which have suffered so much. And when Melbourne goes into lockdown, it causes such huge issues right across regional Victoria because the regional Victorian economy to a large degree depends on the Melbourne economy. So I say that Victorians have had enough and that's why I call on Victorian Federal Labor MPs, including Mr Miles, Ms Coker, Ms King and Ms Chesters to come out in support of the national plan. And I say to Labor, please, stop your negativity. Please start acting in the national interest. The national plan we have developed and agreed on is our pathway to living with this virus. That is our goal, to live with this virus and to do the best we can as a nation working together. It's a plan based on the best possible scientific, medical and economic advice. 
and I would argue available, best advice available to any government in the world. Let's not forget that 12 months ago, we didn't even know whether we would have a vaccine. The fact that we have a vaccine that has been rapidly rolled out to all Australians is an incredible scientific achievement. Uh, this is largely going to keep us safe from this terrible virus, which has caused such havoc in Australia and around the world. But we are getting through this and we are managing. So again, to Labor, to those opposite, please let's focus on our success. Please let's focus on what we are achieving. Please let's focus on the scientific breakthroughs that we have seen here in Australia and around the world. Your time has Please expired, Senator Seward. Please celebrate what we are doing. Thank you, Acting De Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to this debate. Now, apparently we're being political if we dare raise concerns about the so-called national plan. When that plan, plan? that plan is actually 80 per cent, supposedly 80 per cent of the population that conveniently does not include children of the eligible population. It doesn't include children under the age of 16. Now that is a lot of, a lot of human beings that are not included in the targets. And when I ask the government today about our children going to be included in the targets, they conveniently they conveniently didn't answer that question. Oh, yeah, we're going, to, we're going to a target and we're going to get vaccines out to children at some time in the future, but they did not say and commit that they would include it in the plan. So let's be very clear. Children continue to be at risk because 80 per cent without those under 16 included means that we are dealing with around 65 per cent of the population. And that's pretty scary, folks. So don't accuse us of being political when we raise very genuine concerns. We too look at the science. We too are looking at the modelling. And the Doherty Institute's modelling is slightly out of step now with the current situation, which I think the government acknowledges. But there's also other modelling, the ANU modelling that came out today, the pre-publishing report that came out today. There's the Grattan Institute modelling that clearly shows that young people, children, kids need to be included in the targets. When are they going to be included? It is our job in this place to question government, to hold government to account and raise up these issues, the same as we have done with many others. JobKeeper, increasing the coronavirus supplement. The government, we all acknowledge, did the right thing there. We thank raise those issues. Thank you, Senator. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. This year started out with so much promise because of the lightning speed scientific endeavour that has delivered us the promise of protection through vaccination and the success of public health intervention measures meant that Australians could look forward to a, a vastly superior 2021 to, to the previous year. It is true the failings of the Morrison government to get Australia near the head of the queue on vaccine procurement was evident even in 2020. However, Thanks to the successful public health interventions led by state governments, it all seemed like we might have brought just a little more time to successfully deliver our rollout. And the commitment was there, directly from the Prime Minister, that Australians would be vaccinated and vaccinated soon. In fact, the Prime Minister pledged to Australians that some four million of us would be vaccinated by the end of March. That pledge included further commitments. He promised that every Australian in the first priority group who wanted to be vaccinated would be by Easter. There was hope. Our most vulnerable Australians would be protected and protected reasonably soon. The promise made by the Prime Minister stretched to the vaccination of six million Australians by the 10th of May. And while the vaccination rollout in Australia, even under this pledge, was well behind the rest of the OECD, it's, it still seemed as though we would reach high levels of vaccination coverage within months. We needed just two things to go right. We needed our government to deliver on just two jobs, two commitments, two responsibilities that fall directly at the feet of the Commonwealth government. We needed to keep COVID out through a successful quarantine system whilst we rolled out a successful vaccination program. Seems doable. We thought this government 
this Prime Minister would be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Well, it turns out they can't do either on their own. Because last week, tragically, this nation experienced its highest daily COVID case numbers since the start of this pandemic. And we are nowhere near where we were supposed to be on our vaccine rollout under the Prime Minister's original plan and promise. We all agree that vaccination is our ticket out of this pandemic. So why on earth did the Prime Minister fail to secure, secure deals to procure vaccines in a timely manner in 2020? Our other nations seem capable of doing it. He claimed we were at the front of the queue. And now, now we find we are near the back of the pack when it comes to all comparisons with co comparable nations. In fact, we are last in the developed world when it comes to having our population fully vaccinated. There are still people in the vulnerable priority categories yet to be fully vaccinated. It's quite extraordinary, really, and a far cry from the hopeful optimism we all felt in January, because the consequences of Mr Morrison's failure to do his job has a devastating impact on Australians. Millions of us are are in seemingly endless lockdown. Hundreds and hundreds of Australians are contracting COVID every day. Borders are closed. Businesses are struggling or collapsing. People are out of work and losing income. The stress and the strain is having a significant impact on the me mental health and well-being of Australians. And it didn't need to be this way. We didn't need to be here, but here we are because Mr. Scott Morrison couldn't do his job. Just two jobs. Job number one, a speedy, effective rollout of the vaccine. Failed. Job number two, manage quarantine. Failed. But for this Prime Minister, every job is someone else's fault. Every crisis is someone else's responsibility. We are in the race of our life. We always were. To get this done, to provide better protection and a hope for a better life. There was always a race, despite what the Prime Minister said. It's been a total dereliction of duty because, as you know, he doesn't even hold a hose. And now Australians have been plunged into uncertainty and disruption because of the quarantine system and the slow vaccine rollout. Australians are crying out for leadership. They just want the job done. They want some hope. They want the promise of January 2021 delivered and all we ever get is more spin. All the while, our health is at risk, our economy is held hostage, families are being kept apart, children are stressed and missing out on school. Australians do deserve better. And interestingly enough, if the first of Mr Morrison's uh, promises and commitments to Australia in early uh, 2021, 70 per cent target would have already been reached. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, those opposite are clearly consistently listening to some form of echo chamber, land of Danistan cheer squad focus group with their constant negativity. I mean, like, do you want Australia to fail? Why are you constantly rooting for Australia to fail? And I would have thought Senator Keneally, as a senator, for New South Wales, that she might have been able to muster some state pride, if not national one. Australia is now vaccinating people at a higher rate than any other country in the world. And in fact, the only thing more impressive than that is the fact that New South Wales is actually leading that charge. So what that means is New South Wales is now vaccinating people at a faster rate than any other jurisdiction globally. Now, I, for one, as a fellow New South Wales senator like Senator Keneally, I'm extremely proud of the people in my home state who have gone out and got vaccinated. That when Gladys Berejiklian set a target of six million vaccinations this month, that New South Wales Welshmen heard the call and they've exceeded those six million vaccinations with still a week to go in August. Now, this is something we should be celebrating. But instead, here we go again with the political point scoring, the talking down of Australians, and what Australians are actually going out to do in record numbers. 
In fact, there have been over 17 million doses of vaccinations delivered to date. But really what's so remarkable about that is just three days ago we were at 16 million vaccinations. So for those of you that suffer with the, you know, str uh, uh, you know, struggle with the maths here, that means in the past three days we've seen one million doses delivered. Now no one could have got their first and second jab within three days, which means there's been one million Australians received a vaccination over the past three days. So I would like to say thank you. Thank you to them for making themselves safer. Thank you for making your loved ones safer. And thank you for assisting all Australians get back to their lives without lockdowns. But perhaps that's where we find the problem. Perhaps you don't want to return to any form of normality. Perhaps you've developed some form of fetish for lockdowns, and I mean each to their own. But this predilection affects millions of Australians and hundreds of thousands of businesses. We need to break the lockdown cycle, and we know via the Doherty modelling we can start to do that at a 70 per cent vaccination rate. So just let me break it down for you. More than 85 per cent of over 70s have received their first dose, with 58 the second. More than 75 of over 50s have received their first dose, and almost 45 per cent their second. And more than 50 per cent of over 16s are protected with their first dose and 31 per cent their second. But what we also know is that both New South Wales and the ACT, they have over 60 per cent of all of those eligible having received their first dose. Now, unfortunately, Queensland and Western Australia are lagging well behind with their numbers in just the mid-40 percentile. And whilst those opposite are very fond of asking questions about being a race, well, here you go. Have your race. Get on to your state premiers and start encouraging them to get their citizens vaccinated. And I know those of you from outside of the premier state, that is New South Wales, maybe get on to those premiers and your CHOs and get them to understand this requirement. And perhaps while we're on it, Senator Keneally might like to ask the member for Maribyrnong, who's such a fan of the AZ, to give the current opposition leader a call. Firstly, he could teach him how to actually say the words AstraZeneca, and then perhaps he could start to get out there and practice by encouraging people to get the vaccine rather than desperately trying to slow it down with his fear-mongering. Those of us on this side actually understand the tolls these lockdowns are having. But perhaps the mental health toll that these lockdowns are taking is beyond you. That the rate of teenage suicide and self-harm is rising. That we have a generation of kids that, quite frankly, these lockdowns, they're breaking. We know that Lifeline is receiving record-breaking numbers of calls each and every day. This morning I heard Roderick Reese on Sky News. He was speaking with Peter Stefanovic. His business, Cairns Adventure Group, it's unlikely to survive if he can't at the very least get interstate travellers to visit Cairns. And I'm sure Senator Green will be on the phone to Premier Palaszczuk pleading with her to ensure that fellow Australians are able to travel into state at Christmas to not only see their families but to be able to support these businesses who are absolutely at breaking point. But when you hear these premiers go against what the National Cabinet devised, who agreed the plan and then walk outside to political point score and further jeopardise the well-being and the livelihoods of so many within their own states. I mean, do they even begin to comprehend the damage that they are doing to not only the business owners, because I know those opposite aren't too fussed with small business owners, but the workers employed in those small businesses? The uncertainty that this prevarication causes for those workers when they don't know if the small business they work for will be able to survive. So I remain an optimist. I am hopeful that very soon your focus groups will tell you 
that the day of lockdowns being a vote winner is over. I am forever hopeful that you will start to support Australians. Not, you don't support all Australians and their families, their jobs and their businesses. Because if, if you don't, those opposites start to understand these devastating consequences of refusing to accept that we need to start to live with this virus in the same way we live with the flu, same way we live with the flu, that the mental health consequences will far outweigh the damages that COVID could ever do. And whilst those opposite continue their scare campaign and fear mongering, I'd actually like to congratulate Victor Dominello, the New South Wales Minister for Customer Service and Minister for Digital, on the creation of the inclusion card. What he's doing here is he's allowing businesses to check people in rather than the other way around. So it's this sort of innovation that's going to assist in opening up New South Wales. I mean, if only all the, news, all the premiers had the same focus. And we know that there are people that struggle using a smartphone, aren't that tech savvy. And in fact, I still have a giggle when I think about one of the posts I saw last week uh, that someone put up that their mother wasn't quite sure to do with all the photos of the QR codes they'd taken because they'd hold their, their phone up and take a, a photo of it rather than checking in because the technology was just maybe a little sophisticated. Uh, but you know, it's also really good and an important movement forward for a lot of people with a disability that would struggle with the same sort of technology checking in. And I would like to acknowledge that from tomorrow, 25th of August, all NDIS participants over 12 years of age will be eligible to get vaccinated. Every NDIS participant over the age of 12 will be eligible. Now, for those wondering why it's not under 12, it's because no vaccine is approved for anyone under 12. So when we all start chiming in about how many children are going to be vaccinated, no vaccine globally is approved anywhere around the world for children under 12. So my son, gorgeous Fredo Frog, he's 12, and I, for one, will be getting him vaccinated as soon as possible. Because I understand, unlike some of these anti-vaxxers out there, that vaccines don't cause autism. What they do, though, is ensure people with autism don't suffer this serious illness. I'm also pretty sure vaccines uh, contribute to decent spelling and use of uh, correct grammar, but that's a whole other matter for us to discuss at another day. But so what I would like to say to those opposite, and really it's a very, very simple message. I think even those opposite may be able to understand it. Please stop the politicking. Please start to back Australians. And to Senator Keneally, be proud of your state. Let's get back to life. Let's get back to travel and help support the mental health of all Australians. Uh, Senator Patrick. On the scientific breakthroughs that we have um, seen here in Madam Australia. Madam Acting Deputy President, some 4.5 million Australians have not been seen Senator vaccine. Patrick, can you start again? There was some um, noise that, and I couldn't hear you. Could you start your, your contribution again, please? Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. Some 1.5 million Australians have not yet received any COVID-19 vac vaccination. Not Pfizer, not AstraZeneca. Three in four Australians are not yet fully vaccinated. The Prime Minister massively bungled the vaccine procurement and his government is now engaged in a mad scramble uh, to increase and accelerate, accelerate vaccine shipments from overseas. He will eventually achieve uh, satisfactory levels of vaccination, but it will be many months later than what it should have been. And indeed, uh, there will have been great social and economic costs associated with the delay. What is so also particularly worrying is the extent to which the Prime Minister's so-called plan for reopening Australia is being uh, wrapped and accelerated by his political objectives. The declared target of full vaccination of the 80 per cent of eligible adult population excludes one in five adults. That's 4.6 million adults. And all children below the age of 16, that's 4.8 million kids. At the 80 per cent level, millions of Australians, including uh, 
children and teenagers will not be fully vaccinated and will still be vulnerable to the virus, including potential long-term de uh, debilitating effects. There's much argument about the Doherty Institute modelling. However, um, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that the Prime Minister is willfully disregarding the scale of the New South Wales Delta strain outbreak and the spread of the virus amongst children. These factors uh, surely deserve much deeper investigation, more than just one institute, and that analysis should be made public. Uh, in the, in the, it's a case of a looming election policy skewing the Prime Minister's view on this. Australians are right to, be, to question his judgment Senator, in relation Senator to Senator Patrick, to your time right has expired. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, if you listen to the noise coming from the government, um, you know, you, they're trying to hold everyone else to account except themselves. And sure, we've, I think we've heard, I can't quite remember, Mr Morrison finally admit that um, he's lagging behind in the vaccine rollouts. But let's put the facts on the table. So the Morrison government, the Morrison-Joyce government has failed to deliver, to deliver on its promises to vaccine 4 million Australians by the end of March 2021. Now, okay. He might have actually acknowledged he, fail, he, he failed to meet that target. But then he was going to vaccinate all the priority groups and, and care workers by Easter 2021. We know that aged care workers are not fully vaccinated. And that stops clearly at the feet of Mr Morrison and uh, Senator Colbeck. Uh, there was that promise to vaccinate 6 million Australians by the 10th of May. 2021. And of course, we've got the um, mandated vaccines now for aged care workers uh, to be done by the 17th of September. I can't see that happening myself. And of course, we were going to make sure that everyone over 70 was vaccinated uh, by winter of 2021, and we're just a few days away now from spring. And of course, that big promise to vaccinate all Australians by October 2021. Now, these aren't um, magical numbers made up by the opposition. These are numbers put out there by Mr Morrison. Is it any wonder that we've got vaccine hesitancy in this country when we've got a prime minister who can't even meet his own targets? Now, the, the group that I'm now really concerned about, and I heard actually uh, Minister Reynolds on radio this morning talking about the NDIS. And if you'd listen to her, you would think people with disability are lining up all over the shop and able to get vaccines. And that's clearly not the case. Uh, after Minister Reynolds had finished her uh, seemingly apparent trying to hoodwink the Australian community, we had a, a, a mother call up about her child who's got a disability, who's within the age range to get the vaccine, to say despite her going everywhere to try and get a vaccine, the earliest she could get one was October. You know what Minister Reynolds's response to her was? Keep trying. Keep trying. This is the government who's responsible for the vaccine rollout. And we know there's been vaccine rationing all over this country. And what's happening right now in Western New South Wales amongst First Nations communities is quite frankly shameful. And sure, the Premier of New South Wales and Mr Morrison can get up there about their six million, but the reality is those figures need to be broken down because it won't be 30 odd percent received their first jab in Western New South Wales. It'll be nothing like that. And it's shameful that the Minister for Aged Care uh, and representing health said in here today, they're doing their best. They should have been on the front foot with First Nations communities, not the back foot. And I'd like a map of Australia to show us the appalling rates um, amongst First Nations people for vaccine. And I want to know just exactly what the government is doing about it. Now, in the ACT currently, Significant numbers of people are coming down with the Delta strain and they're under 40 and significant numbers of them are children between the ages of from 12 years on and we've seen primary schools and high schools have to be shut down. In New South Wales it's the same and if we are not now proactive
actively looking at getting vaccines for that age group, for the 12 and up, uh, then again Mr Morrison will fail the Australian people. The need is there. We've got disastrous uh, vaccine rollout across this country amongst vulnerable uh, groups and now clearly amongst children. And sure, we're now starting to vaccinate uh, children who've got some sort of disability or illness, but quite frankly, that's not good enough. That is not good enough. Other countries are vaccinating children from the ages of 12. And where on earth is Moderna? Where is it? You know, we've been promised it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Well, I'm sorry, you have failed at vaccine rollout. You should be ashamed of yourselves and finally admit it. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, it is certainly clear that Labor got the memo this week about their key speaking points. With everything else going on, Labor are ensuring they keep it negative. Shock, fear and loathing. Bad vaccination rates, bad PM, blah, blah, blah. Yesterday, it was to quote the PM ab nauseum. Oh, he said it's not a race. How bad is our Prime Minister? Well, they've been harping on about that for quite a while now. And they've also been harping on about how the Prime Minister had just two jobs, they say. Well, I'm sure the Prime Minister would love to only have two jobs, but the reality is not so simple as the Australian public are well aware. It is not as simple as Labor delivering their tired sound grabs, and yet they accuse the Prime Minister of being addicted to slogans. It is true that early on in the piece the Prime Minister did say it's not a race because he wanted to keep our public calm. He could have said to the Australian public, don't panic. We have the vaccine. We have a plan. Stay calm. He used different words. Did we get everything right from day one of the rollout? No. And the Prime Minister has admitted that. Did the changing a target advice throw a spatter, spanner in the works of the best laid plans? Absolutely. But we are not the only country that had to pivot and deal with changing advice regarding different vaccines. And I'm not quite sure what Labor are proposing when they harp on about the fact that we didn't have enough vaccinations early enough. We were also a country with the lowest, one of the lowest rates of infection in the world. Did they want us, as a wealthy Western nation, to push other countries aside and say, give us your vaccine? Atrocious. But while the public were told it's not a race, that does not mean our agencies, our healthcare workers, the vaccination hubs and others have not been racing. Indeed, from a slow start, it is now clear that they're racing like far lap. Per capita, as Senator Holly Hughes said earlier, People in New South Wales are now getting vaccinated faster than the peak of vaccinations in the US and the UK. Dr Nick Coates were tweeted on the weekend that UK was the world model in vaccinations and now New South Wales is exceeding that. And we're rolling out our ancillary troops. GP clinics across the country have now administered over 9 million doses. Community pharmacies are delivering AstraZeneca. The Royal Flying Doctor Service, in answer to Senator Lyons' worry about our remote communities and Indigenous communities, the Royal Flying Doctor Service have delivered 22,000 jabs into the arms of our most remote communities through 90 site visits, as well as delivering nearly 14,000 additional doses to remote health services. Even our defence force is engaged. In my state, the ADF delivered 1,500 vaccines at a pop-up clinic in Dubbo just last Saturday, one day. We are now delivering well over a million doses a week. In fact, the most recent data shows it took just three days to deliver the last million doses. So we are often racing. 
but we don't want to panic the nation. And while this motion is right in that we didn't meet the six million target by the end of May, we are now getting almost that figure out per month. And at current rates, we are on track to have 80 per cent of the over 16 populated population vaccinated by the end of November. But it requires a level of personal responsibility. People need to come forward. So I say to Labor, stop fear-mongering. Stop looking in the rearview mirror. Stop harping on about past targets missed and look at what we are achieving. Look to the horizons. And I say to the 30 per cent of eligible people who are now fully vaccinated, thank you. And I say to those coming to get vaccinated, thank you. We're moving forward. Uh, Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It is difficult to see the rising COVID numbers in New South Wales, and it is also heartbreaking to watch the New South Wales Liberal government shaming people in certain communities in their theatre of compliance because they have failed to control the spread of COVID. And ultimately, Scott Morrison has failed to roll out a vaccination program early enough, and it is having a huge impact. The multicultural communities being over-policed and singled out by the New South Wales government are also now carrying a disproportionate burden of this outbreak. Southwest and Western Sydney are full of essential low-paid workers who carry out the bulk of the needed critical work. They are first responders, grocery store workers, train and bus drivers, delivery drivers, child care workers, nurses, aged care workers, and so much more. Getting their jobs done means that they are shouldering this pandemic while all the time risking exposure to the virus. But rather than thanking the people of Southwest and Western Sydney for doing the work we all so desperately rely on, they get told off, put under curfews, and a heavy-handed police crackdown. This might be a cheaper strategy than proper wage subsidies and income support, but it's also shameful and discriminatory. Overcrowded housing is at its worst in Sydney's West and Southwest, yet the government keeps telling people to stay home rather than providing safe housing for all. The Morrison government's botched up vaccine rollout, mixed messaging and blame shifting has created mass confusion. Despite efforts to divide and paint multicultural communities in a different light, a report by the New South Wales Council of Social Services found that attitudes towards vaccine and multicultural communities mirror those of the general population. I know that low-paid brown and black workers might be the easiest of scapegoats for politicians, but shifting the blame onto people of colour really needs to stop right now. Just stop. It is not just unhelpful. It stinks of racism and is doing immense harm to so many. Oh, thank you. Uh, Senator Sheldon. Senator Sheldon. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Well, I'm speaking here from Sydney in our ninth week of lockdown. And I listened to the government senator saying, look at what we've achieved. You've achieved nine weeks. Nine weeks where small business, working people, families are put in an extremely difficult situation as a result of the government's failure to sort out a national quarantine system and to organise an efficient and speedy vaccine rollout. As COVID-19 ravages New South Wales, the vaccine rollout is still months behind schedule. Victoria, the ACT and even New Zealand have been forced into lockdown by the outbreak which began in Bondi. It is unthinkable that 18 months into the pandemic, six months into the vaccine rollout, and nine weeks into lockdown, that many of the most urgent priority groups for vaccines are still being left behind. People are still waiting outside in the pouring rain for hours at a time to get a vaccine. Just 26.9% of NDIS participants over 16 are fully vaccinated. That is less than the general population, despite them being in phase 1A or 1B in the urgent and high priority groups for vaccine access. Anne Kavanagh, a professor of disability health at the University of Melbourne, has called the rollout for disabled Australians, and I quote, negligent and a failure. So these aren't complaints. This is a call for the government to get its act together and get its act together today. And there, are pregnant, there was a, a pregnant woman who was finding that she could only book a vaccination appointment five months from now. 
recently reported in the, in the news. This is despite the recommendation from ATAGI in June that pregnant women be urgently vaccinated due to severe risk of COVID to their health and that of their unborn babies. Then there is a disability and aged care workforce who Scott Morrison promised would be vaccinated by April. Well, it's nearly September and more than 40% of aged care and disability workers are yet to have even their first jab. The Health Services Union has reported that workers have been struggling to access, access vaccines. The HSU says that aged work care workers have had to cancel appointments in order to go to work so that they can put food on the table. That is the reality for a workforce which is 90% part-time or casual. No Australian should be in such a precarious position in their job that they are forced to miss out on critical medical appointments just to get by. When health workers are making so many sacrifices, when they are risking their health and well-being, caring for those who are vulnerable, the least we can do is make sure that they don't have to lose shifts or to pay to make their vaccine appointment. The fact is that small businesses and working Australians, particularly in Western and Southwestern Sydney, are doing it tough during this lockdown. I think also the business and working Australians, Victoria and the ACT, who are being impacted by the Bondi outbreak. And of course, many other parts of the country from not being able to receive um, tourism and uh, exchanges from, from state to state. But when people are doing it tough, they need short-term support and they need a longer-term vision for how we can get a better to a better place. I know a new report by the Community and Patient Preference Research today, which found vaccination take-up is almost five times more likely if a $300 payment is on offer. That's not whinging, that's about solutions. This is government refusing to do it as a, as a result of uh, the opposition proposing it. Ludicrous. That's exactly what Labor has promised, proposed. And it's about time the Morrison government dropped its ideological opposition to providing financial incentives to vaccination. Mr Morrison certainly has no issues with giving billions in JobKeeper to Jerry Harvey and his pals. I'm sure Mr Morrison can cough up a far, far smaller amount to salvage our national vaccination program, which is still struggling to catch up from his instance, insistence that it isn't a race. Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. I can't hear you, Senator Roberts. It's Senator Roberts, can you hear me? You'll you'll need to. You have to log out, log back in, Malcolm. Yep. So, uh, Senator Roberts, you will need to log out and log back in, and in the meantime, we'll go to Senator Stilljohn. Senator Stilljohn. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. For disabled people and our families, the pandemic has been a time of unparalleled fear and anxiety. Many of us have been trapped inside our homes, scared to go outside since the very beginning of the pandemic. Through this time, we have worked as hard as we can. We have banded uh, together, we have collaborated, we have raised our voice to our state and federal governments and argued, cajoled, convinced, persuaded, presented discussion papers and expertise and sometimes even pleaded for a plan that would vaccinate us, that would give us what we need to be safe. And from the very beginning of the pandemic, the Morrison government has repeatedly failed to heed our advice, failed to engage with us effectively and failed to provide us with the protection and the support that we need. At the very beginning of the pandemic, we discovered that there was not a single person in the health department whose job it was to make sure that the initial response supported and protected disabled people. 
Months into the pandemic, we discovered that there still was not a plan. Months later, there was still no plan. And now we discover that as far as we are into this great crisis, no more than seven than 26 percent of NDIS participants have been vaccinated. And there are still about half of folks living in residential settings that are yet to be fully, fully vaccinated either. This is absolutely unacceptable. It puts disabled people's lives at risk and it must be urgently <coughs> addressed uh, effectively. Senator Still John, your time has expired. Uh, expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Please go ahead. Thank you. The safety of everyday Australians should never be a race on a political scoreboard. Instead, it must be about health and accountability. Yet this government and most people in parliament hastily rammed COVID injections on people. Vaccines are not fully tested and only provisionally approved. Vaccines with serious side effects, even killing people. Vaccines with plummeting efficacy. The injections are already losing their effect. We've been told that we do not need 100% vaccination to protect. Why then do governments, parliaments and big businesses continue to persecute people rightly concerned about this injection? A constituent, Ben, Ask a simple question many are asking. If your vaccine works, why does he need one? If it doesn't work, why should he get one? Secondly, Australians have a right to sit this race out. Instead, we're hearing democracy choking, the death of our right to say, no, this is not for me. Without a blush or hesitation, Qantas CEO Alan Joyce threatens the jobs of people who are concerned about COVID injections. Yet the same man signaled the need for IR reform now to protect workers supposedly from abuses of power. Respect people's rights. Restore informed consent, a basic human right. Is it any wonder millions of people now question everything state and federal parliaments say and have reached a breaking point? No, it's expected. The ongoing protest must be heard. Australians have legitimate concerns for health and safety, for jobs and livelihoods, for rights and freedoms. The unions and Queensland Labor, old Labor, used to defend the right to protest. They're a symptom now of the problem from taking away people's freedoms, jobs and livelihoods. In turn, state and federal governments must get back to basics and focus on the virus, not the symptoms. Whether we came here from before Captain Cook, we're from Europe or from Afghanistan, we Australians have one flag. We are one community. We are one nation. Senator Roberts, your time has expired. The time for the discussion has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration